So this evening, we're going to uh, look briefly at this center in the middle of your handout. It says in chapter 20, there's a conflict that Abraham has, a conflict between Abraham and Abimelech. And it's kind of interesting if you scroll over here in your handout over to the left side, you find out that early on in his time in Israel, there was a conflict between Abram and Pharaoh. And it was the same kind of conflict. This is one of those spots as we come into chapter 20 where we scratch our heads at the father of faith and think, how in the world did he do that? Why in the world did he do that? And yet we see God's faithfulness to him. And we're going to learn that the lesson from this foible of, <clears throat> of the great patriarch is not to think, well, we can do whatever we want to and God will take care of us. No, we ought to be impressed by how God kept his promise even when his chosen one did that which was wrong. So the background to this story is told to us in chapter 20, verses 1 to 2. We're told, Now Abram journeyed from there down toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. Abram said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And that is the background to the story. Now I'm going to uh, show you some maps that I've got a couple pages away in my document, but you don't have them. Here is a, a map of the southern part of the Promised Land. Uh, the, here in this spot that's circled number two, Beersheba, that's where Abram's going to end up towards the latter years of his life. But we're told that now after the time that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, that Abraham sojourns, that he's, he moves from here and there. He's down here in the uh, in the the, let, me, listen, let me go. The wilderness of Paran down here to the south, the wilderness of Shur. He's kind of wandering around in these southern deserts. The word Negev means south. He's in the southern part of the promised land. He was a sojourner his whole life, but this is a period where he's moving around quite a bit. He's now moved into a part of the promised land where he appears to be relatively unknown. He, he's developed a reputation in other parts of Canaan. But not here. He is somewhat unknown, and he's somewhat uneasy about the situation. And so he's made this agreement with his wife, Sarah, who is, by the way, his half-wife. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, half-sister. <laughs> See, he's a real wife. See, he's a, he's a half-sister. He's made this agreement with her, apparently, that when we get into these awkward situations, I want you to only tell part of the truth. I want you to introduce yourself as my sister, not as my wife. Uh, Scholars are not exactly sure what it is that Abram's trying to do by doing this. It, it's long been supposed that he might think that people are going to try to kill him to get his wife, and then they get not only his wife, they get all of the inheritance that he has too. But somehow if he passes her off as his sister, maybe he can escape, and if things get bad, then maybe he could mount some sort of a rescue. It's hard to say. It's, it's very twisted thinking. It, it's foolish it's carnal thinking on his part. He is what Solomon said later on, to use a phrase of Solomon, he is leaning on his own understanding. He's trying to find his own way through the trouble. And it's surprising, considering how many times we see Abraham doing great feats of faith. But there are some things where he's weak. And isn't this true of God's people? Even the greatest of God's people today and throughout church history have had their weak points, and sometimes they trip on it again and again. Uh, we need to learn that we are not immune. We, we don't reach some level of, of spirituality where, where we no longer commit foibles, where we no longer have to be on guard against living in fear within our hearts. So here's the background we just mentioned. He's sojourning in the south. He's in unfamiliar territory, and he kicks in this agreement with his wife that she just pass on part of the information and so the conflict begins in the middle of verse 2, the latter half. It says, so Abimelech, king of Gerar, uh, 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 sent and took Sarah. Gerar, I don't know if I showed it to you on the map. Did, did you see that? Gerar is over here in the left region. So they've now migrated over uh, kind of in what would later on be known as the Philistine plain. Um, there's this guy named Abimelech. Abimelech is probably not his birth name. Abimelech means father of a king. It's a dynasty name. He plans to have children after him to sit on the throne. Uh, he has some sort of a small kingdom there in the Philistine plain. 
And as ruler of the plain, he can take to himself whatever women he chooses to. And so far as he knows, Sarah is available. She must have been a particularly attractive woman to be now in uh, her uh, late 70s, 80s, and desirable enough to be brought into the king's harem. But then look how God intervenes uh, despite the foolishness of Abraham. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night. And by the way, notice that it doesn't say the Lord, as in Yahweh, but God, because uh, the Lord does not have a relationship with Abimelech. Whenever, usually, when God speaks to Abraham, we're told the Lord told him to do such and such. But here, God Almighty comes to Abimelech in a dream, said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now, I want to pause to say that the concern here is not just that adultery is about to take place. Abraham has compromised his wife and put her in a place where she's morally uh, fragile. She's in a delicate situation. But that's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is that she has not yet given birth to Isaac. If she becomes a a functional part of the king's harem, there is going to be great ambiguity as to who the father of Isaac is. She is already pregnant with Isaac. But if she moves into the king's harem, who knows whose father it is? And the whole issue of the, the line of promise from Abraham to his son, to the next son, to the sons of Israel, the whole thing goes into question. The same kind of thing happened chapters earlier when he had the same sort of conflict with Pharaoh. Back then, his wife was not pregnant, but there was the concern that he would lose his wife and the promise would fail. Now there's a question of the promised child how can they vouchsafe whose child it was? That, I think, speaks to why the Lord intervenes with such a dire threat here in verse 4. Uh, verse 3. Now, Abimelech, verse 4 says, had not come near her, and he said, Lord, Master, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. I wasn't meaning to steal someone's spouse. They lied to me. Both of them. Now, we could, we could uh, argue over how much integrity a pagan king has. But, but in this point, he's right. He had not willfully done something to violate the family integrity of Abraham and Sarah. Verse 6 Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. So that explains the dire warning. That's God stepping in to stop it. Now, therefore, verse 7, Restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die. You and all who are yours. Whew. Severe threat. It's not unlike, it's not unlike the kind of thing that God would tell Pharaoh in the days of Moses. Let my people go or else. So what we're seeing, here's a pattern that Israel's going to fill in. Israel's going to be unfaithful in many different ways, but God is going to intervene on their behalf and, and shake the nations to let them go free. And so here, unfaithful Abraham in this story is going to be shaken free. It's a display of grace. In one sense, Abraham is not deserving of this rescue. He's made a bed. You ought to lie in it, you could, you could argue. But God has a plan of grace. God has set his love upon Abraham. And look how he comes to, to rescue him in this way. We're told that uh, in verse 7 that Abraham is a prophet which is interesting because we've not seen any prophecies by Abraham. But what this means is that Abraham is one who speaks for God. He's one of the few people in this point in in the history of the world, uh, in in this age of the world, who knew the living God and who spoke for him. And as Abraham repeated the promises that the Lord had given to him again and again, he was in essence prophesying. He's someone who has contact with God. So, you, you uh, treat him well, restore him, 
then you will live. And if you don't, the judgment I warned of will come. So then in verse 8, So Abimelech arose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were greatly frightened. Then Abimelech called Abram and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And notice there's no response from Abraham because he's right. Abraham is to be blamed here. Verse 10, And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? What what happened to you while you were sojourning with your flocks and that, that you thought up this plot to get me into trouble? Verse 11, Abraham said, Because I thought, surely there is no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from from my father's house that I said to her, This is the kindness which you will show to me. Everywhere we go, save me. He is my brother. (laughs) He's bringing up that that foolishness he thought of 25 years earlier. And we don't know, Genesis doesn't tell us, but we wonder, did he try to pull this off in some other instances too? He's motivated by fear. Um, he, he, he knows, yes, there is no fear of God in this place. They're godless people. There's a fear of God in the place right now. And so many points, he's proven wrong. And he, leaning on his own thinking, instead of, Trusting in the Lord, the Lord who had shown himself faithful. Abraham, who does it in other points, trusts in the Lord, doesn't here. And yet look at the Lord's grace to him. So now we come to the resolution of the story in the remaining five verses. She's released. Abraham is enriched. Abraham, uh, verse 14, uh, Abimelech rather, Abimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you. and Before all men you are cleared. Now let me explain. This is kind of like a reverse bride price. When somebody got married in ancient days, the, the, uh, the, usually the bride's family had to pay you know quite a bit of money and this was partly to 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 vouch for you know we are standing behind this loved one they are pure they are prepared for marriage they are yours this is a clean transaction well here it's done in reverse a thousand pieces of silver we're not talking about coins we're this is um, 25 pounds of silver the average worker low-level low-grade worker in the ancient world could expect to make about 10 pieces of silver a year. This is an enormous amount of money. Abimelech is making sure that he doesn't fall short of God's requirement that he restore Abraham. He restores him and enriches him. You know, it's much like what happens when Israel comes out of Egypt and the Lord enriches them with the gold and silver of the Egyptians. Israel, who remember that in the days of Moses, they're the first ones to read the story written in the Bible. I'm sure it was passed down by mouth before, but they couldn't help but see the similarities between themselves. And, and, and they, what they needed to do was learn to imitate the best features of Abraham and learn to avoid the bad ones. Verse 17, here's Abram, the prophet doing his work. Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid so that they bore children. And we learned that was already a curse in place. Verse 18, for the Lord had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Here's a man who would have had a large harem. He is, it's often common for uh, kings in the ancient world to beget as many children as they can. And uh, even though there might be only one legitimate heir to the throne, it's a, it's a token of their pride and of their arrogance, and, and it, creates a, uh, uh, it creates a wealthy upper class that has to be maintained by the taxes down below. But for some period, we assume some months, no one's getting pregnant. And then, but after Abraham prays, the, that common grace is restored to them. 
Isn't it ironic? Abraham is praying for Canaanites to have children. <laughs> and when he hasn't had one yet himself, and the Lord answers his prayer, which illustrates to us that this whole thing about the child being born, according to the promise, was completely the work of God. So here's this conflict between a local king and Abraham. Despite Abraham's failure, he comes out on top. Well, now we move into chapter 21, and this is the conclusion to the stories of Abraham. Now we're going to find in these chapters about the birth of this promised son. There are five major parts to the story of Abraham. There is an introduction when he's called. There's a conflict between Abraham and Pharaoh. There's all of that intrigue between Abraham and Lot. Fourthly, there's the conflict between Abraham and Abimelech we just saw. And then the end of Abraham's stories, we have about five chapters that bring all of the promise to it, the first stage of its conclusion. Isaac, the child of promise, is finally born. Now, uh, you have some columns there on that chart, but I'm going to have you go to the back page because the back page has more detail about these chapters. The back page focuses just on this concluding section, these five chapters about the child of promise. Let's come over to chapter 21, uh, verses 1 to 21, and we have now the story of the birth of Isaac and the expulsion of Ishmael. The birth of Isaac is told in uh, verses 1 through 8. We're told uh, in the introduction of verse 1 that the Lord's promise is fulfilled. Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah, whom Sarah born him. Notice specifying we're talking about now the one through Sarah, not the one through Hagar. We're not talking about anything that Abimelech did. Uh, this is what Abraham has sired and called him Yitzach. Laughter. Yitzach. And then in verse 4, then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Remember, Abram had been circumcised just a year before at age 99. But the command was now every generation after you, every male, to be circumcised on the eighth day. Um, it's uh, theorized, there's different theories as to why the Lord chose the eighth day. And we're kind of guessing. Uh, I know there's been some medical research to say that after the eighth day, the uh, newborn baby is able to clot better and one bleed as badly. That may be a part of God's plan. It, it might tie in with the cycle of there's, there were seven days to the week and then the eighth day is like a new day, a new beginning. Maybe that's it. But uh, the most important point is that he's following the covenant. The covenant God made with Abraham says, this is the sign. You know, I, I, I told you to cut yourself in a place that would make it seemingly impossible for you, old man, to have a child. And look what God does. And the reason for Isaac's name is given for us in verses 5 through 7. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. That's right, let that hit you. 100 years old. <laughs> Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, uh, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And then the summary is made in verse 8. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. We, we just fast forward a whole bunch of time because the ancient custom was you weaned a child at age three. Age three. That guaranteed he had his mother's milk for a number of years. He'd be nourished. And now to the point he's weaned, then you often have a big celebration to, to rejoice that your child has made it through the most vulnerable years and, and now more regular life and diet and things will be picked up. The time to celebrate 
But this brings up some old wounds. Now that the promise has come to life, literally, uh, there's still some tension between the two sort of spouses of Abraham. Remember that Abraham has taken Hagar, who was the, the servant of his wife, has taken her as his concubine. A, a concubine is essentially a kind of wife who doesn't have all of the privileges. Has certain privileges of being a spouse, but uh, not, it, it, he, sh he should not have done it. Every time multiple marriage shows up, especially in Genesis, every time it's a mess. It is inevitably a mess. And so the stories are told about, you know, um, Abram doing this and his son and grandson and great grand they're all doing this. And the Lord works through it, but it's a mess. If they had only stayed with what happened in the beginning of the book, when God made one man and one woman to be together, much of the pain would have been avoided. Well, we see some hostility between Sarah and Hagar in verses 9 uh, and 10. Now, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. So, it's fascinating. Now, this story is going to be about Hagar and her son. What's her son's name? Ishmael. Yishmael which means God hears. And yet, his name will never be mentioned in this chapter. He's always the son, the lad. Uh, because in the grand story of things, it's the line of Isaac that God uses. God has a plan for Ishmael, but not the plan. So Ishmael was mocking. We don't know exactly what, but uh, he, he would be... Um, he would be quite a bit older at this point. He's going to be in his teens. Um, is he being a typical adolescent? I don't know what that would look like in ancient, uh, in ancient Canaan. But she's had it. So in verse 10, she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Now there wasn't any ambiguity about where the inheritance was going to go, but she wanted to make a point. You know, we've got the promise fulfilled here. He's been born. He's been weaned. Why do we have to put up with this? This was your idea anyway. Well, actually, it was my idea. You have to admit it was, it was her idea. And so she uh, commands, demands that he be sent out. But notice now, beginning in verse 11, that God cares for Ishmael. There's a divine assurance given to Abraham in verses 11, 12, and 13. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. He loved Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac your descendant shall be named. And of the son of the maid, I will make a great nation also, because he is your descendant. Here's another painful point in Abraham's life. We've been studying the story of his offering up of Isaac, but in a way, he's here commanded to not offer up, but to let go of his other son, his first son, his illegitimate son, yes, but his son that he loves. The Lord commands him to go along with the carnal request of his wife, not because she was right, but he had a plan. This is the first test that Abraham has with his kids. And notice how the Lord, though, here gives him a promise and a prophecy beforehand. Later on, the test that comes in the next chapter, there's just a command. There's no promise. There's no prophecy. But here, there's a reassurance. Yes, I know this feels bad. This feels wrong. But I am going to intervene. I will make of him a great nation. I'll bless him because he comes from you. And though, then we find divine assistance for Hagar in verses 14 to the 9 thing. So Abraham arose in the morning and took bread and a skin of water. Water bottles were made of leather usually. And gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder. And gave her the boy and sent her away. Just enough provision to get them started and then the rest is in God's hands. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness Beersheba. Let me show you on the map where that is. Um, 
Be'er Sheba, that's just to the west of the Dead Sea. They'd been over in Gerar in the previous story. Be'er Sheba is a place where they will spend a lot of time, Abram's family. So she's wandering about just out in this arid, dry country. Let's not get back to my spot. So then, picking back up in uh, uh, verse uh, 16, then she went, I'm sorry, verse 15, when the water in the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. And then she went and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away, for she said, do not let me see the boy die. And she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. Uh, he's a young teenage boy, but uh, this is really arid country. We don't know the time of year, but it doesn't take long to become completely dehydrated. It doesn't matter how strong you are, you can only last that so long. And he begins to, to faint before she does, and she leaves him but doesn't leave him. She's nearby, but she just can't bear to see his demise. Verse 17, God heard the lad crying. Remember what his name means? The name that's not used here. God hears. God heard the lad crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. Isn't it interesting? There's so many parallels between this story and the next story. An angel from heaven intervening, calling their attention to something. A provision. In the next story, it's a ram in the thicket. Here, it's a well that had been unseen. God has provided and then the conclusion in verses 20 to 21, God's ongoing provision for him. God was with the lad, and he grew, and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer, living off the land, wild hunter. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. His mother, Hagar, she was Egyptian. Mind you, the wilderness of Paran, way down in the south. If you go below that, you're in the Gulf of Aqaba, in the tip of the Red Sea. He'll live now the rest of his days away from the rest of Abraham's family. We'll come back in Genesis to Ishmael again and see how the Lord was adding to him and making great nations of him. But there were some long, there were some deep, deep hostilities, despite God's grace. Well, then we come into uh, the end of chapter 21, which is an a interesting story about a, a conflict between Abraham and Abimelech. It's sort of an interlude. It's about ten verses. Abimelech, with whom the, the Lord had delivered Abraham and Sarah for, for, and they are sojourning in his land. Well, they negotiate a formal treaty. They make a covenant in verses 23 to 26. Uh, 22 to 26. Now, it came about at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me, as you did before, or with my offspring or with my posterity, but according to the kindness that I have shown to you, you shall now to me and to the land in which you have sojourned. Abraham said, I swear it. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the well of water which the servants of Abimelech had seized. So they'd had a treaty and vows were made as a covenant of sorts, but um, some problems come up over watering rights. Verse 26, Abimelech said, I did not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor did I hear of it until today. And so they come to terms now. They solemnize what had been a treaty into a formal covenant now. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. Covenant is a promise on steroids. 
The animals are going to be sacrificed, split in two, and the implication would be if either one of us violates this promise, may this happen to us. Abraham's claim to the Beersheba well is now clarified in verse 28 and following. Then Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Abimelech said to Abraham, what do these seven ewe lambs mean which you have set by themselves? This is after the, the ceremonial sacrifice had been made. He said, you shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand so that it may be a witness to me that I dug this well. Therefore he called that place Beersheba, because there the two of them took an oath. And there's a pun here. Be'er means well, and Sheba can mean two things. There's one word, Sheba, that means seven. It's like our word uh, Shevin. <laughs> Shevin. Uh, our word seven is related to this one. And the, but there's another word spelled exactly the same way that means oath. It seems like there's a, a play on that. He gives them these seven lambs. This is the well of the seven, but this is, more importantly, this is the well where an oath was made, a covenant was made, an agreement, an understanding about who can water here. And then a, there's a summary made about all this in verse 32. So they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, arose and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba. Uh, tamarisks, uh, do you know what those are? They're kind of bushy. Um, they, they, they tend to sprawl. Some of them go straight up. Some kinds of cedars would be a tamarisk, but usually they're more bushy-like trees. He plants that tree there, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. This tree he plants in some way as a memorial. He's, if you will, putting down roots. <laughs> Now, he's not going to build a house here. The only thing he's built here is a well. This is the only structure in all these uh, 25 years that he's built in the prom 28 years, the only thing he has built has been a well. True to God's command, he's a sojourner, he's living in tents, but this becomes one of their main hubs. He plants a tree, his tree, as a token that this is, in fact, land that the Lord has given to him. Uh, he also has some assurance here that um, things are going to be at peace. He has made a covenant with Philistines, something that Israel was not supposed to do later on. But here, this is good. He's guaranteed some safety. But as we come into the next story, the one that we spent so much time on in the last few weeks, the sacrifice of Isaac, we learn that ultimately the, the covenant that matters the most is the covenant that God had made with him. And at the end of that awful test, where Abraham is willing to sacrifice his son and the Lord stops him. The Lord then repeats the covenant, the great covenant, that I will give you this land, I will make your descendants many, there'll be, and new features are added, there'll be more than the sands of the sea in number from this one child who I gave to you, who I tested you to see if you'd give him back to me. God keeps the covenant that's even more important than the one that he has with Abimelech. Well, we'll uh, take a look quickly at the end of chapter 22, a portion we didn't uh, study in the morning series together. Come with me to chapter 22, and there's a little segue, a transition, a focus on one of Abraham's relatives, the family of Nahor. Nahor. Now at verse 20, now it came about after these things, that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz, his firstborn, and Buz, his brother, and Kimuel, the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. So there's a list of his brother's family. Milcah was his wife. And uh, look in verse 21. I don't know if these first two names will be familiar to you. Uz, his firstborn, and Buz. In the book of Job, the book of Job, the miserable comforters who come to help him, come to console him, 
One of them is from the land of Uz. Actually, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, Job himself is from the land of Uz, not quite Oz. And one of, one of the counselors comes, and he's from the land of Buzz. What that tells us about the story of Job is that Job is an extended relative of Abraham. Living in the time after Abraham, but before Moses leads Israel out of Egypt and they become a nation. So the Lord is at work even on Abram's brother's side. And then verse 23, there's some other children through Nahor's concubine. Actually, I missed verse 23. We have the introduction to an important character. Bethuel, that's one of uh, Milcah's and Nahor's sons. Bethuel, the last one in the line, became the father of Rebekah. Here she's picked out of all the other kids there must have been because she will become the wife of Isaac. Uh, Isaac's going to have challenges too. He needs to get married. He needs to have children if the line is going to move forward. But where in the world are you going to get a wife for your son in a land full of pagan Canaanites? You know, Abimelech, you made a good treaty with him, but you don't want to go marry off Abimelech's family. You don't want to marry Pharaoh's family. That's a mess. So here we see in the end of this chapter, the Lord was at work to prepare a partner for Isaac. Some other children through Nahor's concubine are mentioned in verse 24. His concubine, whose name was Reuma, also bore Taba and Gaham and Tahash and Ma'aka. Not big names in Old Testament history, but it's giving the Israelites a sense of history. All of these people who were populating this land of Canaan that we're coming into, a lot of them came from Abraham's line or his extended family. But the one highlighted here, most importantly, is Rebekah. And that will lead us to what we'll look at at another time as we now come into the, uh, the last few stories involving Abraham, and that is the, the death of Isaac's parents. First it will be Sarah, and then it will be Abraham, and then the beginning of Isaac's own family. Next time, in a couple weeks when we're back together, we'll see the touching story of Sarah's death and the first piece of land that Abraham owns in the promised land. It's his wife's tomb. And then after that, the search for a wife for Isaac, a long chapter full of interesting intrigue, which doesn't give a lot of dating insight for today, but we see the hand of God at work nonetheless. And then lastly, at the beginning of chapter 25, the death of Abraham himself. And the torch of the promise passed on to his son. Well, let's have prayer. Lord, we, we thank you for the time we've had tonight to look at these things, these stories of old about people very far away from us. And yet, our story is found in here because it is through Abraham that the promise is fulfilled. The promise which brings life to all of us, blessing to all the nations of the earth, came through the greatest son of Abraham. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we thank you that you keep your promises. Even when we fumble and fail, you are keeping true to your word. So Lord, as we go forth this week and uh, into the lives that you've called us to, may we hold on to your faithfulness and may we grow in our faithfulness to you, not leaning on our own understanding, seeking our own way out, but trusting you to do that which is good for us and to your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.